Hi everyone, today I'm going to cover Bitcoin and the rise of the megacorp. Megacorps are what you think about in the movies like uh, Blade Runner, those huge corporations, and in Aliens where the uh, huge companies that are control massive portions of the economy and are, are kind of like semi-autonomous in a way. And so uh, apologies for the weird background. I'm traveling right now and this is the best lighting that I could find as, and microphone. So <laughs> apologies for the quality. All right, well, let's go ahead and hop into it. So uh, here's the article. Uh, this article comes out every Thursday. Uh, it comes out to my subscribers that subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, you search Dan Held Substack to go ahead and subscribe to it. So this is for paid subscribers only. And this is where I write about it first. So Bitcoin and the rise of the megacorp. When we look at how governments uh, have approached their debt problems, they've had huge amounts of debt to GDP ratio. They've had huge amounts of like structural problems. 2008 financial crisis was key uh, in showing this. And once COVID hit, there was a huge amount of economic destruction unleashed and governments decided to print a ton of money. Um, an example of that is the U.S. spent 18% of its GDP in spending. That's huge. GDP is the entire output of the country. And that's just a, the fiscal response. The fiscal response being like government programs or stimulus checks. Um, the monetary response is like how the Fed approaches it. And those were equivalently large. So the, I mean, they were, the, the fear to such an extent was, um, you know, we had, uh, <laughs> We had the Fed go, we are willing to print infinite cash to uh, make sure that the financial system stays stable. This was a pretty unprecedented sort of move. I mean, that, is, that, is, that has never occurred in human history. And you know, businesses were so concerned that they took out around, you know, that they've hoarded about $2.5 trillion in cash to meet uh, business obligations and whatnot. And this was really interesting to see because you know, companies hold cash to protect against uncertainty also to fund projects and compete. But this is a huge amount of cash. Um, and these corporate executives are starting to wake up to this reality that these fiscal and monetary policies of money printing will lead to that cash pile being very much devalued. And one of the first CEOs to do that, I think the first CEO to do that, was Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy. And uh, this is, I think, uh, yeah, he, he's also purchased more since this time, but MicroStrategy was one of the first big purchases of Bitcoin, they purchased over a billion dollars worth. They started with 250 million uh, and then bought more. And so Michael Saylor being an executive of his company with this huge cash pile, he invested in Bitcoin because as he says, my dollars and euros are losing 15% of their purchasing power every year. His, his money is literally evaporating and that's why Bitcoin offers something for his company to escape that. Bitcoin has a 21 million fixed supply. You can't print more of it past 21 million, which means that there's no politicians, no one else can dilute the value of your money. Um, it's not at the subject of any politician or government or the masses choosing to change it. It, it won't change. It's also the best performing asset <laughs> in the 21st century, 9,000% or 9 million percent return. So it's not only a great investment, but it also protects and preserves your wealth because no more people can't print more units of it. Now, Michael Saylor de-risked this move from a career risk perspective for other executives. Uh, and other, other folks started to pile in, including Tesla, which happened on Monday. That was a huge deal. They put $1.5 billion into Bitcoin. And this was just a, such a massive, massive deal. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, you know, when I look back at, yeah, here we go. So with the, in the Tesla 10K, uh, Tesla says, we've invested $1.5 billion into Bitcoin. Um, we want more flexibility to maximize our return on the cash. And they felt that Bitcoin was one of the best ways to do that. Now, MicroStrategy isn't the biggest holder of Bitcoin in their company treasury, MicroStrategy is, but that was a huge, huge deal. Um, in last week, 7,000 companies attended Michael Saylor's conference. So Michael Saylor had a conference called the MicroStrategy World 2021, and over 89 or 8,000 attendees from 7,000 companies attended this. So 7,000 folks from who work at different companies, some of them in the treasury department are now thinking, should I put our treasury into Bitcoin? This is a huge deal. Um, the amount of Bitcoin treasuries right now is $56 billion and that can be found on bitcointreasuries.org. Really cool website put together here. We can scroll through and see which companies have purchased it. And an interesting analysis done by ARK Invest 
estimates that Bitcoin's price would surge to $400,000 per Bitcoin if just 10% of the S&P 500 companies all allocated their cash. So it's the S&P 500 companies have X amount in cash. If they put 10% of that into Bitcoin, Bitcoin's price would be $400,000. As you can see, this is huge for Bitcoin as these companies start to view Bitcoin as cash or as a store of value, a way to preserve wealth on their balance sheet. It's it's a huge validation of the store uh, gold 2.0 or uh, gold 2.0 gold 2.0 or store of value narrative, <laughs> and additionally it makes it increasingly hard to pan. I mean, what government's going to ban the largest corporations in their country from owning Bitcoin or ban it once they have it? It would cause the stock market to tank. Now, this is all part of something that's got a much bigger movement. Uh, essentially, the emperor or the government has no clothes. Uh, trust in our in institutions are crumbling. Um, and this was laid bare by the poor uh, medical response to COVID, but also the fiscal and monetary responses to COVID and previously in the 2008 financial crisis. And this is what Satoshi was trying to solve for. As he says, the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically. But they, lent it, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction of reserve. We have to trust them with their privacy. I think you get the theme here. It's all about trust. And we've lost that trust with our financial institutions and our government. And Bitcoin restores that. It is a system where it is trust minimized. We don't have to trust anyone human or anyone centrally in the loop. It's a decentralized trust mechanism. And what's even crazier about this is that these different government and politi these different politicians and bureaucrats <laughs> they wined and dined while the rest of us uh, toiled underneath their their policies the governor of california governor newsom went to the one of the nicest french restaurants in the state with him and his friends and you can see here none of them are wearing masks while millions of businesses in his state went <laughs> went under because of his policies and then you also have really weird disconnects with the financial elite janet yellen she says, cryptocurrencies are a particular concern. I think many are used to for illicit financing. Uh, and then also Steve Mnuchin, my right, focuses on digital currencies, make sure they're not being used for illegal things. Well, the total amount of money paid by big banks for money laundering manipulation over the last 10 years was $330 billion. So these politicians, these bureaucrats who are saying that Bitcoin could be used for bad things, they basically let all these big banks with traditional fiat money, they we're talking tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars involved. This was just the amount paid in fines, which is astounding. And JP Moore, or Bank of America alone paid $82 billion in fines for all of this activity. And they, and they think Bitcoin is bad? I mean, this is just insane. Or, or that Bitcoin is the problem? No, <laughs> Bitcoin is not the problem. Bitcoin is not you know, something that like they're afraid of it because they can't control it. Oh, and then and here's one that was really, really, really ridiculous. Christine Lagarde, uh, the ECB president, was convicted of a financial crime. I mean, literally, she's convicted of a crime and she is leading. <laughs> she was leading. She was managing director at the IMF and now she heads up the ECB. I mean, these people are crooks. They're scared and clueless. The corporate leaders can sense it. We can sense it. And that's why we have Bitcoin. And there's a great book called The Sovereign Individual, and they called this out back in the 1990s. So this quote, the more apparent that it is that it is, the more apparent it is that a system is nearing the end, the more reluctant people will be to adhere to its laws. And this is what leads to the rise of the megacorp. So the megacorp, per the Wikipedia definition, is a massive conglomerate holding near monopolistic power over multiple markets. They're so powerful that they can ignore the law. They possess, they possess weapons or private police forces and hold some sort of sovereignty and even act as outright governments. Now this kind of sounds like science fiction. You're like, okay, this is a little bit out there, Dan, but we've actually had these type of corporations before. Um, the Dutch East India Company operated 40 warships and had 10,000 private soldiers. The British East, Indi British East India Company had a 300,000 standing person standing army and was the, one of the largest corporations ever. And same with the Hudson Bay Company. They actually owned 15% of all of North America at one point. And we have new versions of this, the large tech corporations, uh, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Amazon, uh, Apple, and Alphabet. Some of these have bigger user bases than populations. Facebook has 2.8 million billion monthly active users. Um, and they control more commerce. Apple and, <laughs> Apple and Alpha, 
uh, Alphabet and Apple represent a giant percentage of smartphones and are worth more than <laughs> some countries. So the, the top four publicly traded companies combined market capitalization is $5 trillion, which in aggregate makes them lar the third largest GDP in the world, which is wild. And by the way, to put some of this in perspective, the Dutch East India, India company was actually bigger than what Apple is today. Uh, now these prices are a little bit outdated because Apple's price uh, fluctuates, but some of these you know, are, are huge, huge. And so what Bitcoin does is it unlocks the, the final step towards true independence from governments, the control over money. Properly stored Bitcoin is nearly impossible to seize. They'd have to, if you have a multi-sig setup where you have five keys and three are required to recover the Bitcoin and those three keys are in different countries on different continents, good luck. And in the book, The Sovereign Individual, this was predicted that citizens and companies would break free from government oppression through the information revolution that the, uh, the internet plus encryption would change the power dynamics of governments even predicted a, a money like Bitcoin. And just like how the previous industrial revolution led to the breakup of the church and state, this would lead to the breakup of the, the state and money. And why is this important? Well, businesses solve problems for people. That's why other businesses, other businesses and people pay that business for their goods and services. Everything in your life is created by a business, not by the government. We were talking like all the food you have, all the technology, all the medical, medical attention, that was, that was all created by private companies incentivized by making money to build better services and products for people. Governments interrupt that process by inserting themselves poorly uh, into that natural flow of funds to fund different activities. Governments ultimately will have to treat citizens and companies like customers. Instead of treating them like slaves or they're like, you have to do this, they're gonna go to them and be like, please, we'd like you to do this, or what can we do to service you better as a government? And Bitcoin is a key component to that transition to the information that is predicted in the book. With its hard to seize nature, uh, and immutable transactions, Bitcoin resists the systemic overreach of the government in, in commerce. And we're already seeing some corporations declare their independence from government, including Elon Musk's other companies, SpaceX and Starlink. For example, Starlink could allow for servers to run in unregulated and unclaimed territories that can't easily be taken down. Like, for example, you could run servers in Antarctica. And if we extrapolate that to space, so SpaceX, then these corporations are beyond the physical arm of Earth-based governments. SpaceX has actually come out and said, <laughs> and I think this is so amazing, um, essentially that there will be not no laws. Uh, of course, journalists tried to misinterpret this, um, but essentially what Elon said is that, you know, we don't recognize the legitimacy of other governments on other planets, that this is a new world, and that we should be able to do whatever we would like there. Of course, a government is just a collective uh, group of people that decide what rules govern them. And so, for example, what they said under the Mars governing law was for services provided on Mars or in transit to Mars via Starship or other colonization spacecraft, the parties recognize Mars as a free planet, that no Earth-based government has authority or sovereignty over Mars activities. This is incredible. Of course, U.S. government, <laughs> of course, governments on Earth should not be able to control any other body. We should be free. If we go spend the work and effort to go colonize it, we should be able to do whatever we'd like. And Bitcoin represents that final step in setting individuals and corporations free from the physical constraints of a state system. And Bitcoin is that key element to bring about that information revolution and, and will fuel the rise of mega corporations. If you like this, uh, you know, really appreciate you watching this far. Throw me a like, subscribe, uh, subscribe to the channel, and uh, you'll see me next week. Thank you. Bye.